talk, okay? And we are ready. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, welcome for, for uh, the second day of CART. Uh, our speaker now will be uh, Joanna Raczek. Um, the short version of uh, Joanna is Asia. And this is always surprising for uh, for the people from abroad, but it uh, looks like, like that. Uh, so uh, Asia is uh, working at the Gdańsk University of Technology as an assistant professor. Uh, first, uh, we worked together at the Department of Mathematics, then she moved to the Department of Informatics. Uh, she is a very good mathematician uh, and also the informatician, and um, she joins perfectly uh, these two areas. And um, we know uh, each other with Asia for many years, and uh, I know that she's also very good didactic. Uh, today, uh, she will speak about Roman domination in graphs. And uh, I'm sure uh, we will enjoy uh, we will enjoy um, her talk a lot. So Asha, it's thank you your very turn. much. I'm very happy that it is recorded because thank uh, I've never heard about myself so many nice words. So thank you, Magda, very much. <laughs> I hope you like my talk and it will be easy for you to follow. And I hope you understand everything. Okay, I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, it's okay. Okay, okay. so let us start. Okay, everything works. So what is Roman dominating function? It was defined about 20 years ago by, by some guys from North America, by Ken Dreyer, Hedet Niemi and Hedet Niemi. And it is a function defined on the set of vertices of a graph G. And it is a function such that for every vertex in a graph, a number zero, one, or two is assigned with one condition such that every vertex U for which we assigned number zero is adjacent to at least one vertex V for which we assigned uh, number two to, to V. And uh, the first paper about this domination appeared in discrete mathematics in 2004. So it's a kind of new domination number. And here is an example of a Roman dominating function. As we can see, every vertex is assigned a number one, zero, two, in such a way that every vertex with zero assigned is adjacent to vertex with two assigned. There are also two vertices with ones, but uh, there is no condition, nothing is said about vertices uh, with number one assigned. Here is another example. Huh. Okay, another example again, we have got three vertices with zeros. Each such vertex is adjacent to a vertex with number two, and we also have four vertices with number one, but there is no, the condition nothing says about them. And again, ah, no more examples. So uh, when we have this uh, Roman dominating function, uh, we can define its weight as the sum of the numbers that we assigned to every vertex of our graph, for example, in previous cases, the first one I've show, I showed you, uh, 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 is 6. So the weight of the Roman domination uh, function here is 6. Second definition uh, on this slide says that the Roman domination number denoted by Greek letter gamma with R is the minimum weight of a Roman dominating function. RD, RDF is a short for Roman dominating function. So in other words, we can wrote the definition in more mathematical way like that. And yeah, here the weight is six, um, but can we go, can we make better? Can we make this function to be smaller than six? Let us try. 
Uh, another example, the second one you've seen already is also six. The weight of the function, Roman domination function is also six, so it's the same. But we can do it with only four. We can find a Roman domination, uh, dominating function with only um, with weight only two, and uh, this is the best and optimal solution for for this graph. So for that graph, the Roman domination number equals four. We cannot do any smaller. We cannot go. You know, decrease it to three or two, it is impossible. It's quite a small graph, so it's easy to see that it is impossible. Okay. Uh, why people define such a new um, domination number and why is it called Roman? Uh, the history goes back to the fourth century uh, after Christ, and, and there was a Roman Empire, and it was consolidated and reformed by Emperor Constantine the First. And he did some remarkable things. He reorganized the economy by introducing golden coins, uh, denarius, and he allowed religious tolerance in his empire. Before that, there was such a kind of re religion tola tolerance, except for Christianity. So, yeah, it was quite a big step. And he built new capital, Constantinople, and today it is called Istanbul. It is in Turkey, a very huge city in Turkey. And he also reorganized army. And uh, this domination has lots of common with reorganizing an army by this empire and Constantine I. What did he do? Um, he decided to place forces not only on the borders, but throughout all the empire. The empire was huge and it was difficult to keep it strong and keep it in one piece, keep it united. Um, he also, there was also problem, as always, with money. <laughs> uh, so the problem was with payment of the army, which was up to 75% of all the taxes. So it was very important to get everything they could from the army, or at, at least possible cost. So what did they do? Um, the Constantine decided to differentiate communities of the empire in three categories. And first category was those with mobile and stationary troops. So mobile groups of soldiers and stationary groups of soldiers. Category two, only those with only stationary troops. And third category, places without any soldiers at all. And the condition... Um, was that communities without troops must be neighborhooded of communities with mobile troops, so that in case of any attack, then can be, they can be defended. So as you see, as, as when you analyze this condition, it says actually exactly the same as the condition in the Roman domination function. So, uh, the first category can be considered as a vertex or a place with two uh, stationary, two, two, oh, sorry, two troops of, of soldiers. So if so, then in this place we can uh, um, we can assign number two of Roman dominating function, and those without troops at all, it is something. Oh, I can write it. I think. Let me try. Oh, okay, so those are when we put number two in our Roman, dom Roman dominating function. Here is one, because there is only one troop of soldiers, and those are places without troops at all. So this condition says that if there is a place without any soldiers, it should be neighbored with a, by a place with at least two groups of soldiers. Okay, So this is exactly what the Roman dominating function definition says. 
Um, this kind, uh, it wasn't so straightforward to define Roman dominating function. So, I mean, those uh, guys who defined the Roman dominating function did not read the history book, but very famous mathematician Ian Stewart did it, and he wrote a paper in 1999, defend, defend the Roman Empire. It was published in Scientific American, and because when the guys uh, from Domination read this paper about, by Ian Stewart, they decided to define the Roman domination number and the Roman domination, uh, Roman dominating function. So as I said previously, each vertex in a graph represents a location in the Roman Empire and yeah, and there are some more definitions. So a vertex is considered unsecured if no legions are stationed there. And otherwise it is secured. An unsecured location vertex V can be made secure or can be secured by sending a legion to the vertex V from an adjacent location with two legions. It is very important that uh, the soldiers don't leave a place alone without any soldiers at all. Okay, why is it dominating set? Why is it a domination number, Roman domination number? Why, why, why this notion? Um, it is because it is highly connected to the notion of dominating set at set D is a dominating set of a graph G if every vertex outside of the set is adjacent to a vertex of D. And the size of a smallest dominating set of G is the domination number denoted by gamma of G, the Greek letter gamma. Uh, so those definitions are quite similar, not identical, but they are quite similar. I will show you later in other examples why. And uh, please remember that the Roman dominating function, uh, we use also Greek letter gamma, but with letter R, capital letter R in its index. Okay. Um, in the first paper about Roman domination in graphs, so very interesting um, properties of this domination number were studied. For example, this is the very famous chain uh, about connecting a Roman domination number to ordinary domination number. And it says that the Roman domination number is never smaller than the domination number and is never bigger than twice the domination number. Uh, in this graph, we know that the Roman domination number equals four. Um, but what is the original domination number of this graph? It is not difficult to see that to the domination number, um, we should take that vertex and that vertex, two vertices. So the dom if we choose those two vertices with blue over inside the, the blue ovals, we see that every vertex outside the blue set is adjacent to a vertex in the blue set. For example, that vertex is a neighbor here, that has a neighbor here, that one here, that one here, and so on, so on. So this is the nominating set. And we cannot do it any smaller. It is the best possible solution. We, in this graph, we cannot find a dominating set with only one vertex. So the domination number here is only one, um, is, is only two, sorry. <laughs> so we can write that the domination number is two and two times two is four. So we see that inequality change chain is fulfilled and that we have equality in the upper bound. So the, the Roman domination number equals twice the domination number. Another example, maybe let us start from the original domination number. Um, let us take, it is a good idea to take D to the set and B to the smallest domination number. Now we only have four vertices that need to be, domi need, need to be dominated, V, X and W and I. So let us put 
V and I to the domination number. Mm, we cannot do, we cannot find any smaller dominating number here. So the domin dominating set here. So the domination number is four here. I can't change color, so yeah. So the gamma of G is four, twice gamma is eight. What about Roman domination? What about the, the, the Roman domination number? Okay, let us put two soldiers, two troops of soldiers here and two troops of soldiers here. And now everyone, every vertex except of Z and C is made secure because every vertex without any soldiers is adjacent to a place with two troops of soldiers, so they are made secure. Mm, so we, me we need just two more troops to make secure Z and C. So, uh, difficult to write one. <laughs> okay, so together we have two, two and one and one, so it is six. So for this example, we can see that our Roman domination number is somewhere between the lower and our upper bound. Um, yeah. And last example, um, the domination number. Here we have vertices. Um, the vertices of degree one, like Z, W, A, and C, we call them leaves. And the other vertices, if a vertex is adjacent to a leaf, we say that it is a support vertex. So this graph is a corona of a path P4. So every vertex is either a leaf or a support vertex. So the domination number, to find the domination number, we need to take, for example, D. We need to take either D or Z or both, of, of course, but we are going to find the smallest dominating set. So let us take D and let us no, not take Z. Then U is dominated by W is not dominated. So we need to put W in the dominating set. We could also put U instead of W. So maybe, maybe let us do U instead of W because then U dominates W and also Y. So here we have similar situation with Y uh, and A as we had with U and W. So let us take Y to our dominating set. Then um, A is dominated, B is dominated, but, but C is not. So we need to take either B or C. Let us take maybe B to the dominating set. And we see that we need at least four vertices to our dominate set. So it is four. Twice four is eight. Okay. So let us think now about the Roman domination number. Oh, let, uh, let us put here two troops and then Z and U are made secure. Uh, to make W secure, we just need just one uh, troop of soldiers. So let us put here one. And W, uh, sorry, W is now so made secure. Y, B, A, and C, they are not secured at all. So maybe let us put two soldiers in the Y to make secured A and B. And now again, one vertex, one, uh, sorry, one troop of soldiers into vertex C. Together again, we have six. So we are again somewhere in between four and eight. Okay, mathematicians were very interested where in when we have equalities for those for this change or chain of inequalities and first they yeah they describe when we have inequality in the lower bound it appears to be quite to be a very simple task because we have equality those two numbers are equal if and only if the graph is empty meaning it is uh, complement of a complete graph, so we don't have any edges. In such a graph, if there are no vertices at all, the number of the, the domination number equals the um, the number of F, the number of vertices of a graph, an order of a graph, so it is n, and the Roman domination number is also 
equals is also equal to n. Okay, so those two numbers are equal, and it is the only uh, possible co condition. If there is an edge in our graph, we can put one of those vertices in a dominating set, and the other we don't put a dominating into a dominating set. And in such a case, the domination number is not equal to the number of vertices; it is smaller. However, if we have a graph like that, so an empty graph with only one edge, then we still need two troops of soldiers to make those two vertices connected by an edge secure. So here, adding an edge makes the domination number smaller, but the Roman domination number is still the same. In, in this way, those two numbers cannot be equal. So yeah, empty graph is the only possible case when those two numbers are equal. So when the lower bound is where, when in the lower bound we have equality. Okay, what about upper bound? Is it also such an easy case, such an easy problem to solve? It appears that uh, it is not. Uh, I will um, come back to this problem in, uh, in a few minutes before I will continue this topic. I will show you some basic um, properties of this domination number. So, because we assigned to every vertex of a graph either zero or one or two, we can um, think of our Roman dominating function as a function that divides us or makes a partition of our vertices of our graph into two sets, into two groups, uh, which are non-empty, oh, oh. No, they can be empty, sorry, they can be empty, but they have, of course, empty intersection because a vertex cannot have a, uh, assigned at the same time, for example, zero and one. So let this fun let f be any Roman dominating function, then no edge joins v2 and v1. This is important that this is uh, the smallest, mm, the Roman domination, uh, the Roman dominating function of the smallest weight. This is very important. Okay, so mm, those, this is our graph. I won't draw all the edges, but our Roman dominating function splits our vertices into three parts. Mm, let us say that th that is v2. That is v1, and that is v0, okay? And suppose that there is an edge that joins a vertex from v2 with a vertex from v1. Okay, what can we... And we know that this is the, the, the Roman dominating function of the smallest weight. What can we do in this case? Oh, we can um, take this vertex, since it is already secured, by a vertex with two troops, two soldiers' troops. Uh, we don't need this soldier, this troop that is stationing here in a vertex of V1. We can just put that vertex here. And we can, in this way, we can construct a Roman domination function with a smaller weight, which is a contradiction because we assumed that our uh, F was or is a, a Roman dominating function of the smallest weight. So we don't have ed edges joining V1 and V2. Another very interesting proposition is, uh, property, sorry, is that we, the subgraph induced by the vertices with um, assigned number one, um, have, has maximum degree one. Okay, since we know that there are no edges between V2 and V1, I will draw V1 here, very far away from V2 and V0, somewhere in between, okay? There are no edges between V2 and V1, so I can draw it in this way. Suppose that V is, uh, Roman dominating function of a smallest weight, but um, the subgraph induced by V1 has greater degree than one. So let us assume that, okay. Now the vertices uh, 
the sub graph induced, oh, sorry, by V1 has degree exactly one maximum degree. So let us draw one more edge like that. Okay, and please remember that those vertices have assigned ones here. So what can we do to make this Roman domination number smaller? Oh, we can exchange those three troops of soldiers. I will maybe draw like that. I can exchange them for two soldiers, two troops of soldiers here, and no troops of soldiers here. Okay. And instead of three troop of, troops of soldiers, we just use only, we use just only two, which is better, which is smaller. So again, we have a contradiction because it seems that our Roman dominating function, if there is a vertex of the degree at least two in the subgraph induced by all vertices of the of value one, cannot be the optimal solution, of course. It's not the minimum because there is something better we can do. Okay, another very interesting property. I will also draw it, divide it into V1 here. Remember, just no edges in the subgraph or just uh, independent edges. V2 here and V0 here. Okay, each vertex of V0 is adjacent to at most two vertices of V1. Again, F is the smallest, the best solution for our Roman domination number, dominating function. Okay, so suppose it is not true. Suppose that there is a vertex of V0, let's say that one, and it is adjacent to, oh, sorry, three vertices of V1. Remember, this vertex, has no soldiers at all, and those have one, one troop of soldiers in each place. What can we do? Again, we can exchange that for a better solution. Okay, because here we can, instead of those three troops of soldiers, here we can put two troops of soldiers and here zero. Zero and zero. So again, we can find better solution than we, uh, than we assumed that is our best solution actually. So again, we made something better. So every vertex of V1 is adjacent to at most two vertices of V1. So as we see, there cannot be the vertices of V1, they supposedly, they are not adjacent to V2. They had, cannot have many, many neighbors in V1 and they, and vertices of V0 cannot have too many neighbors uh, in V1. So it seems that the vertices of V1, maybe they don't have many neighbors at all. Maybe they are like, uh, a graph with vertices, they are vertices with uh, rather smaller degrees, not the greater degrees, but smaller degrees. Okay, let's move to another interesting property. V1 here, V2 here, V0. Okay, W2, V2. Sorry, is the dominating set the smallest dominating set of a graph induced by a union of v2, v0, and v2? So when we look at the graph induced by those two sets, so we don't uh, look at v1 and edges between v0 and v1, then the v2 is the smallest dominating set of this now of, of the whole graph induced by v2 and v0. Um, if V0 is not a, just an ordinary smallest dominating set, for example, if um, there is smaller dominating set in this graph, let's say here we have four vertices. Um, let us suppose that those three vertices dominate every vertex of the rest of our vertices. Uh, 
then we can exchange those four vertices which we had in V2 into those three vertices. And again, we can find a better solution. So it is a contradiction with our assumption that the f function f was the best solution for our graph. And again, if quite similar situation, maybe I will just write here V0 and here V2, they are the most important sets for our case in here. So every vertex from V2 has at least two private neighbors relative to V2 in H. So in this graph induced by those two sets. If there is a vertex, like let's say that one, that has exactly one private neighbor. What is a private neighbor? A private neighbor means that there is uh, the vertex, let's say A, is a private neighbor of a vertex V if V is the only neighbor of A belonging to V2. There are no other vertices in V2 that are adjacent to A. So if V has just only one private neighbor, a vertex can also be its own private neighbor. So if V has no other neighbors in in V2, then it is also its own private neighbor. But I suppose that it has exactly one private neighbor. Let's say that A is a private neighbor of V, and so that V is not its own private neighbor. So there must be an edge between V and any other vertex of V2. Then what can we do? We can just remove those two troops stationing in V2, and we can put, okay, because we have like that. That and that. We know that here we have got two troops of soldiers. So here we can have no troops at all because this place is already secured by those two troops here. And here we can just put one troop of soldiers and yeah, we could find something better. If similar, if V its own private neighbor and has don't, doesn't have any private neighbors in V0, then we can do something similar. We can uh, assign one to V instead of two. And again, the Roman domination number, the Roman domination uh, function has a smaller weight. So, yeah. Okay. As I said previously, the finding graphs which for which we have equality in the upper for the upper bound so when the domination number equals uh, the twice domi uh, the roman domination number is equal twice the domination number it's not so easy to characterize those graphs and for this reason they gra the, those graphs have very special name they are called roman graphs okay uh, for example, this graph here, we already told that here the domination number is four, uh, sorry, is uh, two, and the Roman domination number is four. So this graph is Roman because the Roman domination numbers is twice the domination number. So that graph is Roman. Uh, what other graphs are Roman? Okay. For example, um, some paths are Roman, mainly the paths uh, which number of vertices is divisible by three. Um, this path has nine vertices. So to the domination number, we let us say we take that vertex and that vertex. Now they are dominated and the neighbors are dominated. However, there are three vertices in the middle. So let us take that vertex to the domination num to the dominating set. So for this path, the domination number equals three, while the Roman domination number here in every vertex belonging to the domination set, the smallest domination set, we put two troops of soldiers. And it is impossible to to Roma to find a Roman dominating function with just five troops of soldiers. So the 
Roman domination number is equal to six. So this graph, this path is obviously Roman. And if the path grows by three vertices, we can again take the vertex in the middle in the additional part to take the vertex in the middle and again the domination number uh, will increase by one and the Roman domination number increases by two and again we have the Roman. So all those paths are Roman. Similarly, paths that uh, which the number of vertices when divided by three uh, give remainder two also are Roman. And again, those guy to the dominating set and that one. And we have two vertices more and we need to take either of those two vertices to find the minimum dominating set. Let us take that one. And for the Roman domination number, uh, Roman dominating function, two troops here, two troops here, and again, two vertices here to dominate. So we can put two, zero, or zero, two, or one, one, whatever we like. Um, again, the Roman domination number is twice the domination number. It is again six, while the Roman while while the domination number is three. So, again, this graph is Roman, and it is the same if our path is grows by three vertices. It doesn't change. The path is still Roman. If the path is three k plus one, it is not Roman, of course. Um, let's move to cycles. Um, if the number of vertices of a cycle is divisible by three, again, we can take a preferred vertex to have the minimum dominating set. And we put two troops to each such vertex, okay, to have minimum Roman dominating set. So it is six. And this uh, cycle is Roman. Similarly, when the, sun, the number of vertices of cycle is divisible by, by three and gives us remi remainder two, I want to uh, draw the sets in here. Uh, of course, when the number of vertices in a cycle is 3k plus one, our cycle is not Roman. Well, another quite easy and straightforward class of graphs which are Roman are complete bipartite graphs uh, providing. Um, not, uh, we don't have just one vertex. It is, it is not a star. Uh, the stars will be uh, considered in the ne next slide. So here we focus uh, on complete bipartite graphs, which are not stars. And they're also Roman because for the domination number, we just take two vertices. And for the Roman domination number, we need to have two troops here and two troops there to make secure every vertex of our graph. So this graph is Roman star. And every other graph with universal vertex. If there is a vertex connected to every vertex of a graph, so of the degree n minus one, when n is the order of graph, then the domination number is one. So stars and not only stars. And the Roman domination number is two. So again, this graph is Roman. Okay, those are very simple classes of graphs. Um, what about more complicated classes of graphs? Okay, Michael Henning has uh, characteri characterized Roman trees. And there is a whole paper of uh, Michael Henning. I think I won't have time today to show you whole, the whole paper, but he characterized all the fa family of trees as a family of rooted trees that can be obtained from a star by applying three operations. They are described in the paper. And they, there, also is, there is also a proof and uh, Rita Zuazua with her student, master degree student find a counterexample for this characterization of trees because th that tree that you, you see now on the slide cannot be obtained by the original characterization by of Michael Henning, but it is a Roman tree because for the domination number, dominating set, the smallest dominating set, we need four vertices, the support vertices, Okay, so the domination number here is four. 
while the Roman domination number, okay, let us put two troops here, then those three vertices are secured and two troops here. Also those three vertices are secured. There are two left, adjacent two vertices left, and here again, two adjacent vertices left. So we can put one, one, or I don't know, zero, two, whatever we put here, we obtain that the Roman domination number equals two, 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 and two, which is eight. So this tree is Roman, but it couldn't be obtained by the characterization. So as you see, mm, on one hand, the problem of characterizing trees, which are rather simple, um, simple uh, class of graphs, is difficult because uh, yeah, it mm, takes several page, uh, papers uh, of uh, several pages of a paper of a, an article, and also you can make some mistakes there. And a student, just I like you, students, if you are listening to me, you can do some, something significant in a graph theory and for the domination part, of course. Okay. Uh, actually, it is called NP hard to determine if a given graph is Roman, even for bipartite graphs. Uh, previously, we I showed you that it is easy for bipar complete bipartite graph, but in general, for the whole graphs class of bipartite graphs, it is not so easy to determine whether this graph is Roman or is not Roman. So, as you see. Lower bound in the equality change was very easy to characterize the graphs in which we have equality. However, in the upper bound, it is very difficult. I will just show you a short uh, proof for that. Um, we want to say that something is hard and we do this by showing that it is not easier than, than some other well-known difficult problem. So what is the very well-known difficult problem that we know? Okay, uh, this is the three sat problem. It's titled here, and this is short for three satisfactor, uh, three satisfiable, three satisfiable, something like that. Okay. A literal is a logical variable or its negation. So x can be logical value or not x is also a literal. So x or not x is a literal. And we are given a Boolean expression E in a conjunctive normal form. Uh, here I have an example. Okay, here it is a conjunctive nor normal form. It is conjunctive because there is conjunction between the the brackets, okay? So our expression e, e consists of brackets. In brackets, we have exactly three literals. That's why it is th number three here. And those literal are um, connected with disjunctions, okay? Each of which is the disjunction of three distinct literals. And between um those brackets we have the conjunction Th this is the conjunctive normal form cnf for short and the question is is e satisfiable or not okay here we have two examples and as we see and the first one is satisfiable it is enough to uh, It is enough to assign to you three true. Okay, for the first case, u uh, one, u two, whatever. The first um, bracket is true because u three is true. The second also is true for the same case. E two. Um, to make e two satisfiable, we can assign true to each of u1, u2, and u3, then we have true in the first bracket because u1 and u3 are true. And the second one is also true because u2 is true. For the simple case as here, it's look, it looks easy to find whether 
E is satisfiable or not, because we have only two brackets. But if we have more brackets, it makes the um, problem very complicated and very difficult to say in whether E is satisfiable or not. Uh, difficult, meaning that we don't have uh, polynomial uh, algorithms that solve this, this problem in polynomial time. Okay, so it is NP hard to determine if a graph is Roman, even for bipartite graph. Okay, so we show that checking whether G is not Roman is at least as difficult as checking if formula E is in three sat form is satisfiable or not. Uh, okay, G is not Roman if and only if, if E is satisfiable. This is the same as the previous sentence. Okay, so for every literal, for every logical vari variable, we make this uh, small graph. It is a bipartite graph, of course. Uh, we label what one vertex of the logical value, the logical variable, and the opposite vertex we label with negation of our logical variable. And we have three additional vertices labeled W1, W1, W3. We make this graph for every our variable. That's why this graph is GUI called. For every clause, we make just one vertex, CJ. And we have two additional vertices, and the whole graph looks like that. So here we have vertices of our, the, yeah, the small graphs constructed for every logical variable. Vertex B is connected, it's adjacent to every vertex labeled with logical variable or it's and its negation and the vertex C is connected if there is a close C1 such that in close I'm meaning the, the brackets if there is not U1 we connect it to negation of U1 uh, U2 we connect it to U2 U3 we connect it to U3 so every vertex C is connected to a exactly three vertex literals and vertex A is connected to every each to each vertex C. So here you can imagine is C2, here is C3 and C4, and so on, so forth, so on, so on. So for the domination number, to dominate every W vertex, we need to take um, the vertex uh, of variable or its negation. Um, Moreover, it seems to be a very good idea to put B into our dominating set. And um, okay, and then we need exactly one vertex of to dominating set from each diamond. Let us say, uh, let me take that one, maybe that one and that one. Okay, and also now A is obviously not dominated, so let us take A to the domination number. So dominating set, so the domination number is A plus B, which is two plus the number of our variables. Our variables, we have M variables. So altogether domination number is like that. What about the Roman domination number here? So as you see, whether the formula E is satisfiable or not, the domination number is always the same, okay? It is not the case for the Roman domination number. It is different. For B, we need, let us put two troops in B. Um, let us put two for every vertex. Um, okay, here is situation slightly different. If E is satisfiable, we can put two troops for every literal, that is true. So if our um, formula is satisfiable, if U1 is true, put uh, two troops for U1 and no troops to U1 prime. If U2 is true, do the same. If U3 is false to make our uh, statement E satisfiable, put U3 prime, uh, two troops to U3 prime and no troops at all to U3. In this case, if E is satisfiable, in the, um, 
all vertices like C1, C2, C3, and so on, so on, are Roman dominated by the set of true literals. So it is enough for us to put just, just one troop to A. So the Roman domination number in this case, if is satisfiable, equals three plus two N. So our graph is obviously not Roman. However, if E is not satisfiable, if there is not possible to dominate every C vertex by the true literal vertices, um, we need to take instead of one, two troops there to dominate every C vertex. So then the Roman domination number equals four plus two M, which is twice the domination number. And in this case, our graph is Roman. Okay, um, I prepared for you also the characterization of Michael Henning, but I suppose I don't have enough time for this. Uh, the problem was in the definition if, of uh, VS set, there was additional um, uh, um, there was additional assumption that V is a support vertex, and uh, this uh, made it impossible to construct the counterexample find found by Rita and uh, Bernal uh, to make this uh, to belong to this family of trees. So um, this this uh, mistake wasn't so very big, it just uh, it is enough to throw it away from the definition of the S. And I just show you some how those trees are constructed. So yeah, so actually there are, um, sorry, um, there are three families of trees and they are attached by an edge to an existing tree to make it bigger and me bigger. And every such tree belonging to those family of trees is Roman. Okay, I will want, I want to obtain you. Uh, so we start from a, a start T1 and we do some operations, operation of attaching new parts of trees, new trees to existing tree to make new Roman trees with more vertices, okay. Operation T2, operation T2 in other way to, we attach another uh, vertex W to another vertex T3. Yeah, and this is example that's not obtained by Michael Henning, by his, his characterization of trees. Okay, so when you study the graph theory and uh, especially, for example, the Roman domination number and you just focus on just one, uh, inequality change, you can find uh, your problem very easy to solve or very difficult to solve. Uh, so exploring graph theory can be very exciting and very surprising because you never know whether your problem is difficult or easy uh, and so on and so on. If the problem is easy, it is nice. However, if it is difficult, it is also nice because you can publish more papers on this topic as it is done for Roman graphs. There are also some, in, I didn't present you all the results about Roman graphs, just some of them, there is much more. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Asha, uh, thank you a lot. Uh... For, for your nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? I think there are. There are some red hands raised on chat or somewhere. Mm, I have one question to you. Um, because uh, I noticed that the people uh, in some moment were really crazy about this uh, kind of problems and uh, appeared a lot of people about Roman domination and variation of Roman domination, like, I don't know, total Roman, so independent Roman and so on. Uh, have you heard about some uh, application of the, uh, this kind of problems, some modern <laughs> application than this uh, defending of Roman empire? Yeah, yeah, of course. I, once I found a paper about applying Roman domination to chemistry, but when I 
wanted to find it again, it disappeared. Oh. <laughs> but there, yeah, in chemistry. But uh, uh, this classical chemistry. Roman uh, domination or with some other conditions? I think classical Roman domination it was. And okay. also some other papers also. Uh, it, it is a very nice kind of domination. It has lots of applications. Oh, okay. I didn't work straightly on them, <laughs> on applications, but maybe some someday I will. Mm -hmm. Okay, are, are, are there uh, any questions? Some more questions? From fa Facebook or YouTube, Julian? No? No, there are not yet any questions on YouTube. Okay. Okay. So thanks, Asha, a lot again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, ah. uh. A czy możesz już nie udostępniać? A, okej. Okay. Short break or at once we pass to the next talk? I think we can continue with the next talk. Yes, Peter, are you ready? I am. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Peter Borsch from University of Malta, from Department of Mathematics, Faculty of uh, Science. Uh, Professor Peter Borsch is an author of more than 50 papers, according to uh, graph theory, um, in particular in about the domination, about the dependent sets, um, crossing uh, uh, families and coloring, my favorite. Uh, he is also an author of a book chapter in, in the book Advances in Mathematics Research. And I also uh, found, let me, uh, let me show, sorry. Yes, I uh, on uh, your web page, I found a very nice quote, quote by Hardy, uh, English mathematician. Let me uh, read this quote. A mathematician, like a painter or a poet, is a maker of patterns. The mathematician's ma patterns, like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. The ideas like the colors of the words must fit together in a harmonious way. Very nice. I like a lot. So Peter show us the, the beauty of graph theory and uh, I'm giving you the flow. It's your time now. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Magda for, for such an introduction. Um, it's good to see you again. Um, so yes, in fact, with that quote, um, it's one of my favorites too in this sense because I see mathematics as like a form of art as well. And I, yes, I, one of the reasons why I sort of fell in love with graph theory is precisely, you know, the beauty and natural appeal, you know, and sort of being, uh, one could see the applications, real life applications quite clearly. Okay, so I'll share on my screen, my presentation rather. There we are. Okay, okay, so we can see. Great. Okay, so I'll just you know introduce the basic definitions and notation that we use. Um, then I'll explain you know how this isolation problem generalizes the domination problem. Um, then I'll talk about you know problems we addressed, which is you know the the problem for the isolating cycles and also isolating cliques. And then and I'll also talk about um, more general results that this work motivated, okay, uh, beyond cycles and cliques. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll talk about the connections of the study, um, domination, isolation with, with the, you know, very interesting uh, art gallery problem, particular quantiles, uh, 
our, our dollar Ethereum, okay, and sort of how things could be generalized there. Uh, and then I'll um, discuss, um, I'll present some problems that are quite persisting, you know, and seem to be quite, quite challenging actually. Okay, so as usual, all right, um, standard notation, I guess everybody knows this. Um, so for a vertex V of a graph G of K and of V will denote the set of neighbors of V. Um, and square bracket V will denote, okay, the, the same set of neighbors, but with V included. And uh, D of V is the degree of V. Okay, so the number of neighbors of V, not including V, however. And then for a subset S of the vertex set um, and square bracket S then is taken to be uh, the union of the closed neighbor neighborhoods. Okay, so and square bracket V is called the closed neighborhood, for example, and round bracket V is called the open neighborhood, as everybody knows. Um, now, and square bracket S, which is called the closed neighborhood of S, okay, is the union of the closed neighborhoods of the vertices in S. Okay, so take the vertices in S, take their closed neighborhoods, take their union. And we also use this notation G minus S here, okay, that means the stands for the graph resulting from removing, deleting the vertices in S from G. So we have the graph G, remove the vertices in S from G, okay, and what we obtain is denoted by G minus S. Now, if F, curly F, is a set of graphs and uh, F is a copy of some graph in F and curly F, then we call F an F graph, okay? So an F graph is simply a copy of some member of curly F, okay? Um, now, if G is a graph and D is a subset of the vertex set of G such that by removing the close neighborhood of D from G, okay, by deleting that, uh, we see that there is no F graph in what remains, okay? Now, okay, so then D is called an F isolating set of G. Sorry about this, I need to switch off the AC. Um, <clears throat> okay, but this condition that G minus the close neighborhood of D contains no F graph. So the new graph obtained by removing the closed neighborhood of D, okay, that contains no F graph. That is the same as saying, okay, that the closed neighborhood of D intersects the vertex set of every F graph contained by G. Okay, so this is very easy to see. Okay, so if when you remove, so removing the closed neighborhood of D from G, um, gives you a graph containing no F graph. This is equivalent, okay, this holds if and only if the close neighborhood of D intersects the vertex set of every F graph contained by G, okay? So in other words, um, this, an isolating set, okay, an F isolating set is like a dominating set for the F graphs that are inside G, okay? In the sense that well, what is an F isolating set? Is a set of vertices such that every F graph contained by G okay, either has some vertex, at least one vertex that is in D, or a vertex that is a neighbor of some vertex in D. So, in a sense, it's like generalizing, okay, um, going from so what a dominating set, okay, what is a dominating set? The co-closed neighborhood of D, okay, is uh, the, the, the whole vertex set. So basically every vertex is in D or a neighbor or is a neighbor of some vertex in D. Here, what we have now is this, okay, that every graph has a vertex that is a neighbor or is, you know, has a vertex that is in D itself. So it's like, you know, going from dominating vertices to dominating graphs now. This is like a good way of looking at it. But anyway, we can just stick with this, you know, we can just focus on one of the definitions if you like normally, okay, traditionally, well, not traditionally, I mean, this is a recent study, okay? So we have been, the definition that we've been using is that G minus the close neighborhood, KG, okay, remove the close neighborhood, you find no F graph there, you find 
no copy of a graph in F and what remains. So the size of a small SF isolating set of G is denoted by iota G F, okay, and it's called the F isolation number of G. It's always the size of a smallest such set D, subset of the vertex set. We abbreviate, okay, well, when, when the, our graph curly, sorry, our set curly F consists of just one graph, for example, a K cake only of, of a fixed size, okay, where K is fixed or for example, the five cycle or whatever, some fixed graph, okay? We just, instead of using IG, okay, the set containing the graph, we just abbreviate to IG the graph itself. So if curly F, for example, consists of K3 only, I just write, okay, instead of writing the set consisting of K3, I just write IOTA G K3 itself. So what is the problem? Um, given a graph G, Okay, and the set F of graphs, how small can an F isolating set of G be? Of course, and that's the obvious question. Um, how small, not how large, I mean, how large that would be the whole vertex set. So this problem was introduced by current Hansberg just in 2017. Um, it is a natural generalization of the classical domination problem. So I'm going to repeat the definition of a nominating set here, okay, so that we see how Again, you know, uh, formally how isolation generalizes domination. So what is a dominating set? The subset D of the vertex set is a dominating set of G if each vertex of G is in D <clears throat> or has a neighbor in D, okay? In other words, it's a neighbor of some vertex in D. Um, so this means that, okay, that the close neighborhood of D, okay, so D and all the neighbors of vertices in D. Okay, together for, okay, the close neighborhood is actually the whole vertex set. So D, together with all the neighbors of the vertices in D, okay, form the whole vertex set. Now, the size of a smallest dominating set of G is denoted, as you all know, because by gamma of G, okay, size of a smallest dominating set. And it's called the domination number of G. Now, here is like, you know, this is why isolation generalizes domination because domination is in fact the case of K1 isolation, precisely that, okay? So a subset D of the vertex set of G is a dominating set of G, even and only if KD is a K1 isolating set of G. So in other words, Gamma of G is iota G K1, precisely the K1 isolation number. Why? Because if you have a dominating set, okay, it's going to dominate everything. I mean, it's closed neighborhood captures the whole vertex set. So of course, of course, G minus N of D will not even have a K1 there because when you remove the closed neighborhood from G, nothing survives because the closed neighborhood is the whole vertex set. So when you remove the closed neighborhood, of D when we have such a dominate such a set, okay, dominating set. Um, nothing survives uh, because cross neighborhoods grow is the whole vertex set. So not even a K1 survives, and therefore it's a K1 isolating set. On the other hand, if you have a K1 isolating set, what is that? Okay, set of vertices such that its close neighborhood uh captures all, all well, okay. Um when you remove the closed neighborhood, so let's stick with the formal definition. When you remove the closed neighborhood of D from G, no K1 survives, okay? There is no K1. In other words, everything is captured, okay, by the closed neighborhood, if not, not even a, a vertex survives, and therefore that is a dominating. Okay, so isolation, or uh, sorry, K1 isolation is precisely domination, okay, and domination. K1 isolation. Um, so now um, we have this fact here um, that such a parameter is additive, okay, the isolation number. So if G1 up to GR are the distinct components of a graph G, like again, I guess you all know what a component is, okay, a maximal connected subgraph of G. Um, so if G1 up to GR are the 
sort of con- maximal connected subgraphs, the components of G, then the isolation number, okay, the F isolation number of G is in fact the sum of the isolation numbers of these components. Um, so what we actually need to look at, are, okay, uh, are the graphs that are connected because once we have something for connected, for a connected graph, then, you know, you just add things out basically. Um, so suppose G is a connected N vertex graph, graph with N vertices. And uh, consider the special case where F is K1 again. So it's case of domination. Now there is this classical result of, or one of the earliest, but not the earliest result in domination theory, okay, 1962, the domination numbers at most have N. And this is not very difficult to prove, okay, if basically take a largest independent set, for example, um, take its complement. Well, its complement will be a dominating set as well, because if it's not dominating, um, so the, if it's a largest independent set, first of all, or, or even a maximal one, um, then you cannot add vertices to it. Therefore, um, okay, because it's maximal and by definition, or, or because it's largest. So every vertex in the complement of the independent set is adjacent to some vertex in the independent set, and therefore it is a dominating set. On the other hand, what you have in the complement is also a dominating set. So one or the other um, is, um, well, okay, assuming it is connected. Okay, we're assuming connectivity here. Um, so one or the other have to, has to be of size at most half n, of course. And now, so, but gamma g, okay, the domination number is the k1 isolation number, so the k1 isolation is most of n, and this bound is best possible, okay? It's easy to construct um, a graph which attains this bound. Um, so, so in 2000, in their 2017 paper, Caro and Hansberg proved several structure results, okay? Um, they proved various things in, those, in that paper. Um, so structure results, equalities, bounds, for the isolation number, mostly in terms of the order, okay, so the number of vertices, the maximum degree, and the minimum degree of G. They focus primarily on the case where F is K2. This is quite, you know, interesting, um, because what is a K2 isolating set, okay, when you remove uh, the close neighborhood of a K2 isolating set from G, no edge, okay, you find no edge there, no K2. Um, so basically, in other words, it's a set, okay, whose close neighborhood intersects all the edges. So the close neighborhood is what is called a transversal, in fact, um, touches, well, intersects all the edges. Okay, um, so only ver- what survives, okay, um, and it, no edge survives, so you only get isolated um, vertices and what remains when you remove a K2, the close neighborhood of a K2 isolating set. And they also um, focused on the case where um, you're isolating K1, K plus one. What is that? Okay. The graph where one vertex goes to, okay, is adjacent to K plus one vertices. Okay. So we call it a star. Um, one vertex adjacent to K plus one vertices. And the case, or, or, you know, well, we can talk about K1, K rather than K1, K plus one, but here I'm sticking with the way they presented things. And the case where G is connected, okay, as I said, because we really need to study connected graphs. Um, they established bounds for certain graphs, G, like trees, maximal out and planar graphs, cloth free graphs, and grid graphs. They also posed a number of problems. So, these are some of the results that they proved. Okay. Um, so in particular, they proved well for K, K2 isolation. So if n is at least three, well, in fact, okay, what you need here is that n is, or rather, G is not K2. This is what you really need here. But anyway, but you can say you can take n at least three. G is connected again. And G is not a five cycle. Okay. So here we have just one exception the case where G is a five cycle. So G is not a five cycle, then the iota GK to the K2 isolation number is at most n over three. So what does this mean? Again, that you can find a, vert, uh, a set of vertices D, 
such that when you remove it and you remove its neighbors, so when you remove the close neighborhood of D from G, okay, it is of size at most one third n, one third the number of vertices. When you remove it, when you remove its close neighborhood, okay, you find no K2. In other words, you find no, no which survives and what remains. Um, and these bounds are all sharp, by the way. Now, they prove this particular result, but this is not for connected graphs. This is for graphs in general. And this is this raises a question, in fact. Okay, well, what happens for connected graphs? In fact, the bound could improve, certainly. It must, I mean, you know, it's still open. The, the problem is still open for connected graphs. But it's pr probably, okay, if, if we manage to solve it, it seems to be a difficult problem, in fact. Um, but the bound should be... Uh, for connected graphs lower than n over k plus one. This is what I believe at least, but not much lower as I will show you. So okay, the k1, k isolation number, so what does this mean? A set of vertices D such that when you remove its close neighborhood, no k1, k survives. Now, what does this mean? Okay, this means that in what remains in G minus the close neighborhood of D, you have no vertex going to k vertices. In other words, the degree of every vertex in what survives in G minus M of D is at most K minus one. Okay, it's at most K minus one. So no vertex has degree K and therefore the maximum degree is at most K minus one. So this is why it's particularly interesting, this one, um, K one K. Um, IOTA K one K is less than or equal to N over K plus one. Now, of course, um, what do you do? You take um, uh, a number of k clicks, um, disjoint, pairwise disjoint, and like that, you attain the bound. Um, but that's not a connected graph, okay? So um, uh, you you take the union of, take g to be the union of a number of pairwise vertex disjoint k plus one clicks, okay? K clicks of size k plus one that attains the bound, okay, you need a vertex for each of them, and over k plus one, but that is not a connected graph, okay? So the question mark is what happens if you impose the condition that G is connected? We'll come to that later. If G is a tree um, and G is not uh, the tree K1K, K1K K1 K is a tree, okay, um, then iota G K1K is at most an over K plus two, and if n is at least four and g is a maximal outer planar graph, okay, um, then iota g k2. So here we have a case, okay. Here we're talking about particular graphs now, not any g, but and and f being some well k2 or k1k. But here we're talking about particular graphs. G is a three now, okay. And uh, in, in the case of the fourth result, g is a maximal outer planar graph. Iota g k2 is at most an over four. Okay, um, those are four results that motivated quite a bit of work lately. Um, I, I must say at this point that um, uh, this started in 2017, but it's generating a lot of interest and actually quite, quite a, an amount of work has been produced already, um, quite a significant amount. Of work has been produced and it, it's very very clear that a lot more will be done it's like you know this problem is going to to attract much much more attention in fact um so the following are slightly stronger versions of two particular problems they pose now okay so these are two problems that got our attention let curly c be the set of cycles, so cycles, of course, so we assume, okay, we take cycles to be of length at least three, all right? Um, so cycle of length three, the cycle of length four, and so on, all of them. Determine the maximum of the ratio okay, of iota g early c uh, to n, the number, okay, where n, so, and so over, the n vertex graphs g, right? Maximum of that ratio. So how large, how large can the ratio iota g 
curly C, 2N is 2N, B, okay, for G being an vertex graph. And the second problem is similar, but for K clicks, okay? So again, maximum of the ratio L to G, K, K uh, is 2N for, for N vertex graphs, G. And now, before I state this result, I'm going to share another screen. Okay, we have this construction here. I'm, I'm not going to read that. I'll just explain what it says, all right? So for N and K, okay, um, I'll, I'll just share another screen. Okay, it seems it's not showing. Just, just, I just need a. Wait, is we still. I'll, 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 I'll sort it out. Don't, um, don't worry. I'll just. Oh. Fine. Okay. Okay, here it is. I guess you should, you should be. Uh, you can see the screen. You, you should see like this construction, okay, where we have a number of K clicks here. Well, five clicks, clicks of order five with five vertices, six of them. Okay. Uh, what we do is we add a vertex for each of them. Okay. And then these additional vertices are joined by a tree or just a part, whatever you like. Okay. Um, but in some cases, we take it, you know, we allow it, we allow. Uh, any tree up there um, on those additional vertices, okay? So you have, if we're focusing on K5, the graph K5, okay? Um, we produce a number of copies of K5, and for each copy, we introduce an additional vertex, and those additional vertex vertices are joined by a path or a tree in general. Now, you would tell me, what if the number N of vertices, okay, so here we have, five vertices and an additional vertex. So if you have KK in general, or, or even a K vertex graph, K4, you're going to have K plus one vertices here before uh, inserting uh, the tree joining the additional vertices. So how many vertices? So here, for, like for something like this, we have okay, a multiple of K plus one, five here plus an additional the six vertex okay, uh, for each. So, the number of vertices, if it's like this, okay, so if k plus 1 divides n, in other words, you can just have construct your this particular graph, okay, that is defined this way, in fact, um, like this. But what if n does not divide, sorry, k plus 1 does not divide n? Not a problem, a boring case, and um, you just add a few, so, uh, you know, remaining vertices here, what the remainder, you add the remainder, Okay, that number of vertices here, and you basically insert like a tree or, or a path or whatever, whatever you need basically um, for, for your problem, for, for your result to work rather. So this is the const kind of construction we're talking about here. So in order to suppose, okay, we're asking ourselves, what is, um, how small can a K5 isolating set B here, okay? So we have K5s here. If I want to destroy all of them, okay? How many vertices do I need to use? It is clear from this construction that you, you cannot reach, you see, if you take a vertex outside uh, any particular component here without dotted lines, okay? So let's remove the dotted lines, um, sort of the tree up there. Um, okay, you cannot, you cannot hit um, any k click outside that particular component. Okay, by component here I mean, so once you remove the tree up there, okay, the dotted line, you get these components, which consist of, in this case, a K5 plus an additional vertex. So this means, okay, that we can never reach a K5 by taking a vertex out, um, that is not a member of that, okay, those K plus one vertices there, that particular part. Um, so, you need, okay, every K5 needs to be, so to speak, destroyed, reached 
by a vertex, okay, that is in K5 itself, in, in, in general, in the graph itself, or the vertex up there, the additional vertex. So basically, every part here requires a vertex. If you take, but then you can take a vertex from every part and destroy all the graphs you have here that, okay, that you're trying to isolate. And uh, that will do. So, how many, what is the size, how many vertices do we need to form, uh, well, an F isolating set here, F being a K5, okay, being consisting only of K5. We need six, okay, one for each of these here. So this is the construction. This is the way we construct this particular graph B and K that I'm going to refer to. K refers to the size of the clique here, okay? So K is five here. Um, to, well, the order rather, okay, the number of vertices. So back to, okay. Um, I'll share my other, my presentation again. Right. Okay, so the, that is the construction really of this BNK, a graph that looks like that, okay, constructed that way. Yeah. Whatever graph, so if it's, it could be like C5, okay, what do you do? Um, although here I'm talking about K clicks only, okay, BNK refers to um, the order of the clique. In that case, it was five. Um, but the idea is basically to take, to produce vertex disjoint copies of the same graph, okay? And add a vertex for each and then for metry or even just a part, uh, okay? Joining those additional vertices or on, the, on those additional vertices. So I managed to show in 2020, okay? Uh, that if G is a connected and vertex graph that is not a triangle, then the cycle isolation number, okay, C is the set of cycles, so we call it the cycle isolation number, uh, is at most an over four. And, and in fact, equality holds if G is this particular graph, okay, B and K3. Um, so here I need to make an adjustment in the explanation here in the construction, but B and K3 is precise, okay, you take, you take copies of K3 and then you do what I've just explained, uh, the vertex for each copy and join those additional vert vertices by, by a part or a tree in general. Um, and if n does not, the, the sorry, if three plus one in this case, okay, k3, so three vertices plus one does not divide n, then th there's an adjustment for that, okay, it doesn't matter. You, you, you can have at most three remaining vertices and you sort of take the last vertex, the last additional vertex and join it to some three vertices and just do it that way. Um, and this solves problem one, okay? Um, the Karo Hansberg problem one. Our second result, so this, this was now work with uh, my PhD student of the time, at the time, um, Kurt Fennec, now he is graduated, and uh, uh, co author from Thailand, Pawaton Ka Mawi Chanurat, again, work in 2020. Um, we proved that if G is a connected and vertex graph, then unless G is a K clique or K is two and G is a five cycle, which is the result of Karo and Hansberg, okay, K is two, I, Iota GKK is at most an over K plus one. And if G is this graph, again, that I've described, okay, B and K, K, then the bound is attained, in fact. So the bound is best possible, okay? Um, it, it cannot be lowered. Um, this construction shows okay, uh, that um, basically as n increases, you will keep on hitting the bound. So you cannot improve it. And this solves problem two. Okay? This was precisely the second problem here. Now, the case K is one is in fact the domination bound of or K gamma G. So if you put K is one here, what will you obtain? Okay, that's the domination number, as we said. You, you obtain n over one plus one, okay? Sorry, um, n over one plus one, and over two. That was the bound of area. And the case, case two is in fact the Karo Hansberg bound, okay? n over two plus one is three. Iota GK two is at most n over two plus one, k okay, n over three, which is the Karo Hansberg bound. Now, this in fact has um, motivated, so, how would how could one go beyond like extend okay uh, 
the set consisting of the cake ring or only to, to other interesting uh, graphs. Um, so here I have, okay, this part is entitled from cake rings to cake chromatic and k minus one regular graphs. And in fact, cake rings are both cake chromatic and also k minus one regular. Okay, every vertex um, has k minus one neighbors, therefore k minus one regular, and you need k colors to color a complete graph on k vertices. So now, okay, let us define these families. Um, F not k is k1, just, you know, the set consisting of k1, k only. F1, k is the set of regular graphs of degree at least k minus one. Okay, so k minus one regular, k regular, k plus one regular, and so on. Um, F2, k is the set of graphs whose chromatic number is at least k. And F3, k is the union of all of them. Okay, and I managed to show that um, if G is a connected and vertex graph, um, then uh, again, unless G is a K-click, okay? Why? Because if G is a K-click, you need a vertex to destroy it, okay? But a K-click, how many vertices does it have? K. Okay, K over K plus one, that's not good, all right? Um, K over K plus one is less than one, but you need one, okay? So K-click is, okay, is an exception for the bound. Or again, K is two and G is a five cycle, then we have this bound again, okay, which was the bound for um, the case where F was KK here. So this generalizes the K click result. Um, and this holds for, okay, um, for any I of ranging from zero to three, even when you take the whole K, okay? so the union of the other, of, the, of these first three here, you still get this bound. So you isolate basically everything that is mentioned here. You get an over k plus one for all of them. Um, and equality, so, but no matter what i is, um, for i ranging from one to three, however, not k1, k, because k1, k, as I told you before, is still an open problem in terms of like, you know, what is the actual best possible bound um, for connected graphs. So that's, that's 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 an open problem, but but for i, k being anything from one to three, um, and g being b and k, the bound is empty. Okay, so this is best possible again, and this generalizes both the cycle bound and the k click bound, as I've explained. Why the cycle bound as well? Because the cycle is too regular. Okay, so you put um, k degree at least two, so k should be three here. F1, 3, you see, um, of degree at least, so, sorry, de degree at least 2, okay, k minus 1 is 2, so yes, k is 3. Um, and if you put k is 3 here, what do you obtain? An over 3 plus 1, which is the n over 4 bound um, that I managed to obtain, okay, for cycles. Cycles are too regular, so to regular, put k minus 1, okay, equal to 2. And the case, therefore, we, we obtain an over for the over four. We obtain the yeah, four cycles. Okay. Um, so this generalizes both both results. Now um, that we managed to prove. Okay, now we also have a. I also managed to prove a bound in terms of the number of edges uh, for such um, families. Okay, so again, if but however, not including now stars, not including i is zero, k one k, not including that. So iota g of phi k is at most, in fact, m plus one all over k choose two plus two k choose two number of edges of a k clip, of course. Um, and this bound is again sharp, right? So g is a connected m edge graph, okay, m edges. That is not a k clip, however you get that bound. Moreover, we have these cases of equality. Uh, we have here, this is a case where I have full characterization, okay? For, um, this still remains a problem. We still don't know what the extremist structures, okay? We don't have a complete characterization of the extremist structures for this, but here we do have a complete characterization of the graphs that obtain the bound, okay? And they are like this, basically, if and only if, G, well, whatever, okay, there is a definition for this. Basically, it's a graph like the one I described, basically, okay, um, and so on. The point is that we have a characterization. Basically, the extreme graphs are, uh, roughly speaking, almost all of them are like uh, the one uh, I described, okay, the construction I gave you. 
there are, but there are a few others like genes of five cycle and KS2, for example, KS3 and genes of four cycle, and I, there's one or three, okay, um, and so on. And in fact, however, if G is a MK special graph, I'm referring to the graph I showed you on um, in, in the, the, well, the construction and the construction, okay, that in fact um, has an isolation number uh, that is the floor of the bound here. Okay. Um, okay, and this had been proved for K clicks, in fact, by um, together with Fennec and Kama, which are not as well. So we had an edge version in another paper, okay, for K clicks. Um, and then I managed to generalize that result this way. And uh, this, however, this it was not like like th these are not like straightforward generalizations, especially this case. This this was a case where, in fact, in order to prove the bound, this is quite, quite an interesting case. In order to prove the bound, I needed to include this characterization of the extreme structures. And that's quite an interesting thing. I thought um, I sort of managed to didn't sort of that's the way I did it. Okay, so I didn't manage when I was constructing the argument. I re I realized I um, I can actually get to the prove the bound. Okay, by including actually the um, extreme structures in my result. Okay, so now um, I'll start talking about the art gallery theorem. So. Vatal proved in 1975 is a classical result, okay? Suppose you want, you have an art gallery, okay? Assume it's a simple polygon and you want to guard the whole interior. So you need a number of guards that together, all together, see everything, okay? The whole interior of the art gallery. So let's, okay, we'll talk about a polygon in general with n vertices and therefore um, energies, as you know. And uh, how many guards would you need to guard? A simple polygon, the interior of, of the simple polygon with n vertices, you need at most an overtree. That's what he managed to prove. Okay. And in some cases, you do need an overtree. Um, so the bound is sharp. Uh, I'd like to mention, okay, that a, a short proof by Fisk, Fisk proved because the way it's done, okay, the way the proof goes is that you go from the polygon, you add edges inside, and, and you construct until you reach a graph that is maximal outer planar, okay? So you insert edges inside that do not cross. Um, you obtain a maximal outer planar graph. And then basically, um, essentially the proof, okay? The way uh, it was done was to show that is part of the proof was to show that the nomination number is n over three, but uh, you, you take a dominating set with uh, particular properties, okay? So that, Guarding actually works, okay? Well, because actually guarding and domination is not exactly the same thing. They are not exactly the same, but but you can construct a dominating set in a clever way that sort of is is your guarding set, in fact. Um, and but Fisk did it differently. He proved that a maximal outer planar graph. So you start with your simple polygon, polygon construct the maximal outer planar graph, and he showed that every maximal outer planar graph is three. Colorable. And from that, okay, um, basically, I mean, by taking the smallest color class, and therefore it has size at most an over three, but every color class sees the triangle, it's okay, if every, so every vertex, so if it's maximum with our planar, every face is a triangle, so on the triangle, all three colors have to appear, so all three, so every Okay, um, in every triangle, there is a color. That color sees the whole triangle, of course. So if you take any color class, okay, you, for example, the color red, um, every triangle has red appearing because it has those three vertices. Um, red has to be one of them, okay, and then you have the other two. But that particular vertex can see the whole triangle, of course. And therefore, all the triangles inside are seen by okay, a vertex with color red, for example, if red is what you fix. So every color class <clears throat> watches, guards the whole maximal outer planar graph, which is actually the whole polygon. But, and then choose one of smallest size by kitchen hole principle, okay? Um, the size is at most an over three, uh, by averaging rather, by averaging. Um, yeah, same thing. 
All right. Um, and that's a very nice result. And it's included in this okay book, um, proves by the book. Valerdo choose to say, you know, it's a book. Think of this book where God sort of uh, writes down the most elegant proofs. Um, and then Eigner and Ziegler produced this book called Proofs from the Book, okay? And they included, so it is a collection of nice proofs, basically. Um, and this, this proof by Fisk is actually found there, you see. Um, now, let G therefore be an invertex maximal outer planar graph. In the proof of the art gallery theorem, okay, Vatal established that the domination number, but as I said, he constructed the nominating set in a clever way that has particular property, okay. Um, but the dominating set that he constructed or that he, well, that he proved uh, it, it exists, okay, um, is of size and, and no, uh, at most an over three. Um, and the bound is sharp, okay. So in some cases, you do need an over three to guard uh, your polygon. Now, again, with um, Kaima, which I know that, um, we proved, so together we proved this result, okay, that the K1K isolation number of, now here we're assuming that G is a maximal outer planar graph, okay, in this section we're assuming that G is an invertex maximal outer planar graph. We managed to show that if N is at least K plus 3, the K1K isolation number of a maximal outer planar graph on invertices is at most an over K plus 3. Um, this generalizes this bound here, Okay, because if you take k is zero here, k one zero, so vertex going to nothing, okay, and that's included in our result, k greater equal to zero, you get an over three, which is precisely okay. And k one zero is in fact k one, okay, and I I will touch k one is a domination number, and therefore that's what you have domination numbers at most an over three. Again, the bound is sharp. Um, Okay, this is what I've just explained. The case K0 is one, uh, the result of uh, well, the art gallery theorem, the domination version. Um, the case K is one is in fact the fourth result of Caro and Hansberg. Okay, if you put K is one, you get an over four. I'll go back to that very quickly. Okay, that's this N over four bound. K11, okay, K is one. So we have IOTA G K11, but K11, one vertex, one vertex is in fact a K2. Um, so what you have, K11 is actually K2, the K2 here. Um, and uh, the argument for this result, okay, that we have here, this general result, um, in fact, yields the following result. So with an art gallery, it's like a, a bit of an extension um, of the art gallery theorem. If an art gallery has exactly n corners again, and at least one of every k plus one consecutive corners, okay, consecutive um, must be visible to at least one guard. So, at, so whenever you take K plus one consecutive corners, okay, um, one of them has to be visible, one of those corners has to be visible to at least one guard. So it's a, a relaxation of the art gallery condition. Then the number of guards needed is at most an over K plus three and the bound is sharp. So again, if you put, okay, so, every corner, every corner, well, that would mean, okay, every zero plus one consecutive corners, every corner has to be visible, every corner has to be visible, that is the case, K is zero, okay, zero plus one, and what you obtain is N over three. So this is actually for guarding corners now, rather than guarding the whole interior. So if you insist on guarding the corners, okay, this is a, a general result for K plus one consecutive corners, in particular for guarding every corner, we again obtain, okay, so you have to put K is zero, we again obtain an over three, which is um, the, the, the vital bound. Now we have this result, okay, that was independently proved by Campos and Waka, Wakabayashi and uh, by Tokunaga that if, now the number of vertices of degree two come, um, come into play here. Um, if n is at least three and g has exactly n two vertices of degree two, um, then the domination number is at most n plus n two. Okay, so number of vertices plus number of vertices of degree two division by four, and the bound is sharp again. Now consider this particular function. Okay, um, 
on AB, okay, it is one, if B is odd and A is to B, and zero otherwise. A particular function, okay, on any pair uh, of, of on any pair of vertices, or on any pair of positive integers. What we proved is this, um, that, so together, so this is okay, so if going beyond gamma g at most n plus n to over four, okay, we have this. Again, n to is the number of vertices of degree two, the domination number, remember that g here is a maximal outer planar graph on n vertices, okay, its domination number is at most n plus n to over four. This is this result, okay, not ours. If n two is at most n over three, and here in this case, n two at most n over three, you obtain that n plus n to over two four is less than n over three. It is now in the particular case where n two is n over three, we obtain n plus n to over four, which is this, okay, which is also equal to n minus n two minus this particular function here, one zero function, division by two. And this is also equal to one over three in this particular case, everything's equal. For, again, a very particular case where n and n two are six and three respectively, this is a very particular case. We obtain now that this new value is, okay, uh, gamma g is at most this value, but this value is actually an over three itself. But then for n2, so going beyond n over 3, remember here we had less than n over 3, then we have a equal to n over 3 here, a very particular case, and then n2 greater than n over 3, now and not this particular case. We have domination number at most this new value, which is now again less than n over 3. So all cases, in all cases, okay, the values, the new bounds are less than n over 3, except interestingly enough, for the case where n2 is precisely equal to 1 over 3, in which case we have equality of all values, okay? The n over 3 bound, this new value of ours, and the, the, the value n plus n2 over 4 here from this result, okay? But this, okay, as you can see, improves the n over 3 bound here, okay, from the art gallery theorem, for all the domination version, rather, for all values except that we have equality, okay, when n2 is n over 3. And, or, well, sorry, or n2 n is 6, 3. We also have this particular case, okay? We have equality here. Now, finally, problems very quickly. So this is actually the, the sort of main problem. There are, as I told you, you know, one could prove other things in terms of degrees, some degree, minimum degree, um, the number of edges, okay, well, could prove bounds in terms of various parameters, but normally we try to have a bound in terms of the number of vertices, some constant times the number of vertices. Um, so what would the problem be um, in this case? So given a set F of graphs, again, the problem is to determine the smallest real number CF. This is what have, we have been trying to do. Smallest real number, some constant, depending on f. If it exists, this is another interesting problem. It's all right, okay? Would would could you could so would there be a, a family for which this particular CF that I'm going to talk about does not exist? Um, such that for some finite set EF of graphs, the isolate the F isolation number of G is at most this constant times the number of vertices. Okay, most of almost all the bounds we saw were like this. Less than or equal to some constant times number of vertices for every connected graph G that is not an EF graph. So, for example, okay, very quickly, for F equals KK, what did we have? We had that CF is 1 over K plus 1 because we had N size of V of G, N division by K plus 1. Okay, we had this result. This one here, N over K plus 1. So, Basically, this gives us that CF is 1 all over k plus 1, k1 over k plus 1 times n. So CF, in this case, where f is kk, we all, um, is 1 over k plus 1. And from that result, and the Karo Hansberg result, so from the Karo Hansberg result, the exceptions are these, okay? Think of these, e, this EF are uh, the exception graphs, the set of exception graphs. 
But the exceptions were K2. Okay, the bound wouldn't, this does not hold if G is K2, and the bound does not hold if G is C5. Otherwise, the bound always holds. So these are the exceptions. In general, now for K not equal to 2, the only exception was KK in our result. Okay, so um, EF. So basically, you need to find the smallest real number C, the smallest constant, okay, such that with the exception of a finite number of graphs, okay, the bound iota, the F isolation number at most, that constant times n holds for every connected graph, okay, except for those exceptions, as I said. Um, now, of particular interest are the following cases. So F is the k length path, F is the k cycle, okay, cycle of length k, F is k1 k, as I explained before, and F, for example, this was, and this is a problem from the Carl Hansberg paper, the set of k vertex trees, all right? You're isolating, so we're isolating k paths here, we're isolating um, k cycles here, in the second case, third case, we're isolating the k stars, Fourth case, okay. Of course, you can, you know, come up with other um, interesting graphs. But these have been attracting attention, and we have these results. Okay, so for k is three, the CF is two over seven, and the F is P three C three C six. This was proved by Wang in two thousand twenty one, but also independently at the time, um, uh, and in a stronger form with sort of consideration of leaks um, involved um, by myself. K is four. Okay, this is. See if F is one fourth here, F is just C7. This was again proved by Wan Zhang in another paper and again independently by myself. Again in a stronger form because I proved this for, in fact, for any three edge graph. Not P4 is a three edge graph. Um, K is five. This is a recent result. K, Chen and Chu, CF is two over nine. The exception is C8. They asked, okay, if the, with this pattern here, they asked if CF is two over two over K plus four. And EF is CK plus 3 and out. Um, and then for, okay, this is the very last part for K cycles. So now for K cycles, not all cycles, that was my result, okay? Cycles of length K, what is the best? So what 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 is the constant? How how how, how does the constant um, improve if you just isolate K cycles? So K is 3, that is my result, okay? The result for cycles in general is, in fact, the result for three cycles. We had CF is one fourth and the tricycle what the triangle, the tricycle is the exception, K is four. This is a recent result with my PhD, current PhD students, um, De Shekruna and Carl Bartolo. Okay, we've just submitted this. Uh, we found that um, CF is one fifth here and <laughs> EF quite an interesting set of nine graphs, three, four vertex, six, nine vertex, six, nine vertex graphs. And I've managed to show, okay, that in fact, it's not going to be one over K plus one. So three here, one over four. So K plus one, four, K is four, one over five, K plus one. So it's going to remain one over K plus one because in fact, I've shown that CF for K greater to five will be surprisingly enough, one over K plus one half at least. Um, and then finally for K one, K, okay, Carl Hansberg result, this is a general result, K one over K plus one will work. But um, I've shown that, um, it's 4k greater to two, CF will be one over k plus one and a half. It's not going to be four connected graphs, not going to be one over k plus two. Okay, so it's somewhere between over k plus one and one over k plus one and a half. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for a nice talk. Do we have any questions, remarks? On chat box. Uh, I have one uh, question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, applications of uh, this uh, subject. Uh, you you also mentioned about uh, art gallery problem. So here we got applications. Do you uh, know any other applications in real world of this problem? Good question. Um, so, uh, <laughs> incidentally, um, like we called it iso an iso well, an isolation measure in the you know in the worst time of uh, COVID. Um, of course, you know, isolation measures were introduced and so on. Um, and basically, one could, although it's a bit stretched, but 
But we had, of course, I mean, we could only go, there were times where we could only go out in groups of four, for example, then it changed to maybe six or seven, and then it started to increase and all things better. Um, but then a group assuming that they know each other, that sort of, you know, you could sort of um, find a smart way, so to speak, of uh, applying this isolation problem that way, because you do not want to have groups, say, if the condition that groups of, you know, uh, you can stay in a group of at most four people, that means you cannot have a group of five people. So you want to destroy, okay, um, all the K cliques that are of order at least five, in other words. Um, so there could be applications of this kind in, in real life. Um, basically, you... Um, sort of, uh, I mean, you, you need, what would the isolating set be, okay? If, if, if you remove mm -hmm. those from the system and their neighbors, mm -hmm. the people that they know, assuming, however, that in a group, everybody knows everybody, um, then what you have outside, okay, the people that uh, can go outside, if you like, um, will never form um, a group that is larger than the number that you're restricting, okay? Um, uh, that you're using for for as, as a restriction. So um, this so so it can be somehow you know one could apply this theory in real life that way maybe um, sort of separating things and so on. Um, but actually, the Karo Hansberg paper had another another very interesting um, was motivated by another interesting communication problem, in fact, um, and it was K2 isolation, however. Um, and it's it's perfectly laid out there and it's it's spot on, so to speak, okay, that um, sort of you have a system of centers, if you like, that sort of can intercept all, all communications, basically, something like that, from what I remember. Okay. But but it's 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 very nicely laid out basically. So again, you know, um, there are applications certainly. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Maybe now any other uh, remarks, comments on the YouTube uh, channel or uh, Facebook? Do we have something? No, we don't have any questions on uh, YouTube or Facebook. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Asha, once again, for okay. today. Uh, I would like to put your attention to the second part of the conference. Uh, it means uh, today we have uh, two other contributed talks streamed on uh, Facebook and YouTube, and uh, there will be also two posters, yes? So it's not the end of, to of today program. Now we have uh, a possibility to, to watch uh, the contributed talks and posters. Okay. Uh, do, we do we have any other announcements for tomorrow, maybe? If no, so thank you once again for your attendance and once again to Peter and Asha for, for your very nice talk. Thank, thank you, you and to see you tomorrow. Thank you.